Cool. All right, hey guys. Um, so I'm here to talk about Halo 4 and some of the architecture we built to support um, that game and future Halo experiences, um, the services behind it. So um, I'm Katie McCaffrey. Um, I'm a distributed systems engineer, and I've spent the last six years working on building services and distributed systems that power entertainment experiences. So I worked on Gears of War 2, um, Gears of War 3, Halo 4, which is what I'll be talking about today. And then currently, I'm working on rebuilding the Go services at HBO. Um, this is my Twitter and my blog, if you care. So um, I'm here to talk about this guy. This is the Master Chief. He's um, a Spartan super soldier that uh, you generally interact with on your Xbox. Um, he has a franchise of games behind him, and I spent about three and a half, four years working um, at 343 Industries, which is an internal studio inside of Microsoft, um, working on building the services that are gonna power Halo 4 and the future um, Halo games. So I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of background um, just so you understand like where we we're coming from, right? Halo was originally made in 2001 by a studio called Bungie, um, and it released on the original Xbox. Um, so what went on there, there was then a series of games that followed. There was Halo 2, Halo 3, Halo 3 ODST, Halo Reach, and um, Halo Wars, which was a spin-off that was made by Ensemble Studios in 2009. Now, all of these games actually had services that powered them as well, in addition to um, Xbox Live out-of-the-box services, um, but they were built on top of um, physical machines and one giant SQL server, and so um, when Bungie decided that they wanted to go off and pursue other avenues and make other games, like they just launched, launched Destiny, um, an internal studio inside of Microsoft was spun up to take on the Halo franchise, and that was called 343. And so they brought me on in 2010 to um, figure out what we were gonna do with the services. Um, I was web service dev number two hired there. So we went through the old stack because we uh, took on ownership of that code and those machines that were running Halo 3 and Halo 3 ODST and Halo Reach. Um, and then we also decided what we wanted to do for the future. Okay, to give you guys a sense of scale, these are some of the um, numbers of copies of Halo sold. So the original Halo sold about 6.5 million, Halo 2 about 8.5, um, Halo 3 hit about almost 12, and then um, Halo 3 ODST and Halo Reach sold less, but they were also not um, mainline Master Chief games. So what was happening there is Master Chief is the main character that you play as, Halo 3 ODST and Halo Reach were spinoffs. They're kind of like Clone Wars from Star Wars, right? Um, still popular, but not not, um, not mainline games. So when we were looking at projected load and projected sales for Halo 4, we had something to go off of. In addition, we also knew that Halo 2 and Halo 3 each sold 2 million games on day one, so that's a combination of pre-orders and launch night purchases. So that basically means you're gonna have all of those people coming online and hitting your service um, on launch night or within the first week. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what the Halo 4 services encapsulated. There's the disk, or the code that ships on disk that you're playing, so that's like your graphics engine and your gameplay. Um, we did not actually build the, the, none of the traffic for actual gameplay was going through our services. That was opening up a peer-to-peer -peer connection between Xboxes. Um, but what we did build was a present system, which was like our heartbeat service, so every 30 seconds or sometimes one second, depending if there's a second screen device connected, you sent us data about what you were doing, so that was like how much, what game you were playing, what map you were in, what gun you had, how many bullets you had in your gun. Uh, we had a bunch of stuff, we knew like pretty much exactly what you were doing. Um, so we made that data available to your friends and did some real-time stuff in that system. We had the statistics service, which encompassed everything about your player, so that was your loadouts, um, what armor you currently had equipped, like what your you know, avatar name was, um, things like game statistics, so how many kills and deaths you had, um, you know, how many headshots you had, really granular data to the level of like how many kills with each gun you had, um, things like that. We also did stuff like daily challenges, which involved, um, our community team would say like, you know, if you go kill 100 grunts in 24 hours, we'll give you this much XP. And so those rotated frequently down from this service as well, and that's how we tracked and awarded points. We had title files, which was our static-ish file service. So that was things like community members could update uh, messages of the day. You could also do things like push down playlists and change them. So like what games and maps and modes were available to help you match make. Um, we had a real-time cheat detection system that analyzed streams of data from the game that would then go 
and determine if you were being a not so nice Halo player. So we could do things, um, and then it would push down an automatic ban if you were being a bad person. Um, and so we could detect things like you were being kind of a jerk on your microphone and we would mute you and then you could keep playing but no one else could hear you so you could just yell at your TV um, and not annoy everyone else. Um, you could also like do things like we could detect if a console was modded and we would apply a uh, a ban where you could no longer play Halo anymore at that point, and we had to notify Xbox, and then they would console ban you, um, so stuff like that. And then we had a user-generated content service, which um, was the way that uh, Halo 4 and like all other Halo games shipped with a map editor called Forge, and it allowed people to create map, new maps and new modes. This was a very like community-powered thing. And then people could upload them online, and you could share them with your friends, and people could download them. And this became, this is incredibly popular in the Halo universe. So people, there were known people who made really cool maps and game types that as the game went on, people would go play these sort of variants that were user-generated. Okay, and then in addition to all of this, we had Halo Waypoint, which was our set of services on like a website and on your tablet and on your phone and on your Xbox where it was like your main Halo portal. So this was everything in terms of you could view all your statistics, you could do some updates to your player, um, there were some second screen experiences as well, and so this was like serving and allowing people to interact with their data pretty much anywhere they were. Okay, so what happened when we shipped Halo 4? On day one, we had $220 million in sales and 100 unique players came online. Within the first week, we had $300 million of sales, 4 million players came online, and they played a combined total of 31.4 million hours of gameplay. And then overall, we had 11.6 million players come online, um, 1.5 billion games of Halo were played, and 270 million hours of like total gameplay was played. And these numbers are a little old, I think they're from June, um, but it's what's publicly released. So um, basically this was a really successful launch. We had no major outages or downtime. And um, so that was super cool to be a part of that team. And now I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we actually got there. Um, so I'm going to describe some of the architectural challenges we faced and how we um, solve them. So this is fake, but it illustrates a point that essentially when you have a AAA game, you go from zero to a lot um, all at once in within the first couple, like 24 to 48 hours. Um, and so you don't really get to like stress test and like slowly ramp things up because that's not a thing. Um, also a triple A game is like a blockbuster movie. So, and, and launch week is really gonna be your week where you have the largest amount of load generated on your service because that's when everyone's playing it. It's when all the reporters are playing it and writing their, um, giving you scores. It's when all the word of mouth from your friends generating it and talking about it online happens. So this is a really critical time period for the game from a business perspective and from like, this is when people are playing your game. So you need to be up. You'll then sort of taper off, and eventually you'll have these bumps like Christmas, where everyone gets Halo 4 for Christmas, and so they all get online and start playing. Um, and then you'll see some other spikes or when we release a map pack, or for instance, when we did a tournament in the summer of 2013, where we gave away, the winner got like some $70,000 truck that was like modified to look like a warthog, which is the car in the game. So there was a lot of people online um, then as well. But typically, like it sort of like te peters off at the end, right? And you'll have some consistent load for uh, the life time of the game. So we did this, the simple thing. We went to the cloud, right? Um, we decided we didn't want to be on physical machines because we didn't want to have to know how much hardware we wanted six months out and like make a bet on ordering it. And then at that point, right, you're like, well, I need to like over allocate because I'm totally going to overbuy because I can't go down during launch week. It just costs a lot of money. So um, we were inside Microsoft, so we went to the Azure cloud. Um, we used worker roles for compute. We used Azure Table, for, which is a key value store for um, storage, for a lot of the storage. We also used Azure Blob as just like our dumb blob store and Azure Service Bus, which is um, for messaging and queuing systems. Um, so this was great because then we could scale up and down as we needed and didn't have to buy all this external hardware. Um, so that's, you know, that's pretty typical, right? So some of the really hard challenges that we had to solve was latency and concurrency issues. We had people sending us a bunch of information. It had to respond really fast because you didn't want to slow down gameplay. Um, and then we had like a bunch of updates coming for a player at any given point in time. So when you typically start building a service, you look at this three-tier architecture and you're like, okay, I'm going to make a stateless front end and a stateless middle tier. I'm going to have some storage. And you're like, that's kind of slow, we just have to go to storage every time on round trip, and like, so what do we do? We throw a cache in the middle. Um, but then this cache causes problems because caches tend to not have the same um, concurrency and semantics guarantees uh, 
and consistency guarantees that your underlying storage has. And so you still have to deal with this issue of, because we had highly concurrent updates, we would have to write a cache manager, um, which would do some kind of consistency um, uh, on access, and then that adds more latency back into the system, and it, and it, and it still doesn't give us data locality. Um, so at Halo, data locality was really important to us. Like the idea of having a stateless middle tier kind of broke down because we had so many requests coming in and so many write requests and then so many read requests that like aggregated a bunch of data um, that having pulling all that data onto a bunch of various stateless machines to serve every request was slow, right? Because you just couldn't keep that much data in a bunch of like, you either had to keep it in a bunch of caches and pull it into like each middle tier on the request that's stateless and then you like toss it all away, right? Um, so because of the nature of our request, we really wanted this property. Um, just to give you guys an idea of like the type of data and how much data we had, this is a page from Halo Waypoint that shows uh, your Spartan and it shows all the dis like high level stats about you. So that's fine. But you can drill down even more and see things like you know how many games you've played, how many um, like your overall stats per game type, your overall team statistics. And you can drill down even farther and you can see like, you know, number of like weapons used and like kills with that weapon and how you are effective you are with that weapon and versus like, or this game type. You can see how many Halo players are currently online in any playlist. Um, essentially, I guess the point is we store a lot of things. We have a lot of updates coming in and we, we retrieve a lot of data and we do a lot of aggregation sort of on the fly. So we took a step back and we decided, hey, we're gonna look at a different model of computation or a different type of architecture. So we started looking at the actor model, which is a framework and basis for reasoning about concurrency. Um, so the actor model is not new. It's from 1973 paper um, written by Bishop, Hewitt, and Steiger, and it actually was a re, they uh, implemented it as a way to solve AI problems. Um, but it's actually been translated incredibly well to distributed systems. So there's a couple of core components to understanding the actor model. The actor model is built on actors as a primitive, so it's like object-oriented programming, objects are a primitive. Actors are like logical entities that can only um, communicate with one another via asynchronous message passing. Um, and so this means that they can't modify each other's states. So you don't have these concurrency issues because they're just sending each other messages. Um, and then on a turn, an actor can do a couple things when it gets a message. It can either create new actors, it can um, send new messages to other actors, or it can modify its internal state and then use that to respond to the message or like update its state machine so that the next message, something else happens. So that's, that's sort of the basis of it. So we started looking around and researching this and we came across this Microsoft research group um, called the Extreme Computing Group and they had this project called Orleans. And um, Orleans is a runtime and programming model for building distributed systems based on the actor models. This sounded really cool, we're like, that's kind of what we've been kicking the idea around as. So we started talking to them and understanding what their framework entails. So Orleans has a programming model built in, um, right? They have actors, which they sometimes call grains. Those are the basic units of computation. Um, and then these grains communicate via passing asynchronous messages. So great, this is what we wanted. So let's talk a little bit more about how that actually works. It's built on top of the .NET framework, so that's Windows, CLR, C Sharp, F Sharp. Um, you declare your actors in an object-oriented fashion using actor interfaces, so you define an interface that has strongly typed messages and methods on it that are all asynchronous, and that's how you def like write your code. Um, and then in addition, everything is based on top of promises. So promise it, every um, Orleans grain call returns a promise, and um, that way you don't have like these hard concurrency issues, like you can just do futures, right, based on top of that. So what this actually looks like in practice is you define your interface. Um, it'll inherit from Orleans.i grain. This is super contrived, right? But like I define two messages on this, this actor and he can talk, uh, he can do two different things. He can say hello and he can say goodbye and he returns a promise with a message back. Um, so pretty standard, right? So this is how Orleans knows how to pass messages or the types of messages that can be passed to the system. Um, okay, so the other core concept to understand about Orleans is this idea of actor references. Um, so an actor reference is um, each grain is uniquely identified by a unique identifier, which is a GUID or a long, and then also it's uh, object types. You can have different types of actors that do different things. Um, Orleans stores this information in addition to um, it's typed as the same as the interface um, and uses this information to route messages throughout the system. So, and this looks the same from either inside of a grain or outside of a grain. So it's the same programming model either way. 
So um, this is how you would get an actor reference. Um, this hello factory is generated by some code gen that runs at compile time from the Orleans guys, and it, um, it's basically saying, I want an actor reference for this grain of I hello type that is ID zero. And so it gets me that, and then I can say, like, send, say hello message to this dude, and then it'll give me the message back. So this code can execute inside of a grain, which means I can then use this to, like, update my internal state or do whatever I need to do, or it can run from, like, an HTTP server, and so then you can use this message as a response to an HTTP request or, you know, pick your protocol of choice. Okay, and then two other things to sort of understand about this programming model is um, inside of an actor, Orleans guarantees that code executes um, single-threadedly, so that's nice because programmers on your team can just write code and don't have to worry about sticky concurrency issues inside of a grain, they just write synchronous code. Um, and then... Uh, and then Orleans has its own thread manager that like has uh, round robins and has you execute. Um, and then in addition, you have uh, persistence, which is wholly left up to you as a developer. Um, and there's a bunch of different reasons for this, but essentially it's because you may want to write to durable persistent storage on every message received if you care about persisting that state. You may want to write on a timer like every 30 seconds, um, or you may not care at all and may not want to persist the state. Um, it might just be like a quick counter or something. So it, it depends, and we used all three of those models in Halo 4. Okay, so this is what it looks like to sort of go and implement a grain. You implement your interfaces, right? Like these methods are actually doing nothing async, but you still return a promise. Um, I like implemented some dumb little counters to show you that, right, I don't have to do a CAS operation here. I can just like add one to it and it's fine um, because there's, this is a single threaded guarantee throughout. And then um, these are not, these extra counters are not being persisted between grain activations. They'll actually go away and start over every time a grain is brought up. So if you wanted to save those numbers and rehydrate them, then you would have to write some code that persisted to storage, durable storage of your choice, right? Okay, so that's the programming model. Um, it makes your life pretty easy as a developer. Um, and then we learned that Orleans, and then also Orleans is a distributed actor runtime, right? So let's talk a little bit about what that means. Um, when you deploy your machines, you give, or when you deploy an Orleans set of cluster, you give it a bunch of machines, um, and each machine on that is called a silo. Um, the silo is running your grain code, but it's also doing some, like, has some Orleans core code running each machine. There's three services it does. It does a messaging system, a hosting system, and an execution system. Um, the messaging system deals with message passing, right? So it opens up a persistent TCP connection to every um, node in your cluster, um, so that, and it manages that TCP connection for you. So you as a developer writing grain code don't have to care. Um, it also deals with serialization and deserialization of the message. Um, if it's on the same box, it'll do something smart, like it'll just deep copy the object and send it to you. And the reason it's doing that deep copying and serialization on every request is because uh, it provides some isolation guarantees. So you can't modify the state of another actor by accident. Um, there's then also the hosting system, and the hosting system uses these actor references to figure out how to route messages throughout the, throughout the silos, right? So when you send a message to, uh, to another grain, the hosting system will take it, look at the actor reference, and then figure out like, oh, it needs to go to this machine. And the way it does that is there's a distributed hash table that's maintained um, throughout the cluster. So this seems kind of slow, right, because you have to do one hop to figure out where it is and then pass a message every single time. But because actor references are so small, they literally contain nothing about the IP address. Um, Orleans has a cache on every one of your silos that in practice we saw a 90% hit rate with. So you weren't actually doing two hops to pass a message, you were doing one um, in practice. So that was really cool. Um, and then there's the execution system, which is basically doing its thread worker role manager and. and um, enforcing the single-threadedness guarantee throughout the silos. Um, there's this other huge concept in Orleans where they have the concept of a virtual actor. So an actor always exists virtually. It cannot be explicitly created or destroyed, which means the runtime handles everything about actor lifecycle management for you. You don't have to do that as a developer. Um, it's also this interesting concept where like an actor doesn't even have to exist in memory. So practically what this means is like the, the, the hash table where like a grain gets placed is not deterministic. And so that's really great and allows the runtime to do a bunch of, solve a bunch of hard distributed systems problems for you. There's a couple concepts that you need to understand about virtual actors, right? Once again, perpetual existence, the thing always exists, it's like a thought entity. Whether it's in memory um, or whether it's uh, not in memory doesn't really matter. It's like once it's been created, it's always there. 
um, you have automatic instantiation and also automatic de-instantiation or like garbage collector collection of these grains. So as soon as a message is passed to a grain, if it doesn't exist, the runtime will bring it up for you and hydrate it with whatever, uh, you get to define an activate method that's also asynchronous. It'll like do whatever you want in your activate method and then it'll pass the message to it. And then in addition, if the grain is idle or the actor is idle for too long, and this is a configurable value, uh, you can have Orlean's garbage collected. And so therefore you don't have to like maintain any of this yourself in your code. Um, we also have this concept of location transparency, right? Like grain place placement is non-deterministic. And this is sort of like if you think about um, when you call someone on a cell phone or send a text message, I don't know where you are in the world and I actually like don't actually really care. I just wanna send you a message. And so the cell network and the cell towers deal with routing that message appropriately. I just have to know your phone number, which is your, um, your ID, and then the message gets passed to you. Orleans works the same way, right? I just need to know your ID, which is like a GUID or an int, and I need to know in your, in what type you are. And then Orleans will pass the message, and it, you might not exist in memory, and or you might be on this machine one time I talk to you, and you might be, or you might be on a different machine in the cluster the next time I talk to you, and it doesn't matter. So this allows Orleans to do a lot of interesting things. Um, because of all these properties, you essentially get automatic scale out because as you add more machines to the cluster, you can handle more load. Okay, so we thought this was really great at Halo, and um, so at this point in time, we've grown from like two people in 2010 to about six people in the summer of 2011 focused on core game services, and we decided we wanted to team up with these guys because the programming model made a lot of sense for us because we were gonna ramp up our team to essentially 30 or 40 people at launch, and trying to ramp up a bunch of people and hire a bunch of people who know how to write like really hard concurrency code is, is, is difficult, right? And so like if we could just be like, we have a ton of features that need to go implemented, we need some C-sharp devs, we can make this happen. Um, and then we partnered with the Extreme Computing Group. They're actually very heavily involved in um, Halo 4, which, and this was like one of the coolest collaborations I've ever seen at Microsoft. Um, so we took their like proof of concept, right? And we had to productionize it in essentially like 18 months. Um, and realistically in three because we replaced one of the in-service um, systems in the fall of 2011. So we started this in like July 2011 and then November 2011 we had a production system running presence for Halo Reach built on top of Orleans and in Azure Cloud to sort of vet that we weren't totally crazy. Um, and they, the Orleans team was awesome. They came and they pair programmed with us. Um, they took our feedback. They, we had access to the source code so we could fix bugs. Um, they actually started taking Halo 4 code and running performance benchmarks against it as they kicked out new builds. Um, and so this was awesome because they wouldn't even like, it wasn't like, oh, they would give us a build and then we'd be like, oh, it like totally, you know, caused performance issues. They already knew about it, right? And so that was really, really fun. Okay, so um, there was a paper that was published in March of this year called like about Orleans detailing um, the guts of it and also a bunch of systems that were built on top of it. Two of them were from Halo. I'm gonna talk about the statistics service. The other one that they detail, uh, go into great detail in is presence, but I wrote like all of the statistics service, so we're gonna talk about that one. Okay, um, I wanted to give you a quick overview of like how we viewed the overall architecture of any grain service that we wrote. We had a lightweight front end that we called the dispatcher that we sort of wrote from scratch because IS was too slow for what we wanted to do. Um, we then had this idea of like what's called an Orleans client running on the dispatcher, um, and he would take in our HTTP requests and he would forward the grain calls to our stateful middle tier, which is our Orleans silos, right? Um, and those were running our grain code. And then the grains would sometimes persist stuff to storage or like query storage to answer, and then you would shoot it back. So that's like sort of the overall architecture of the any kind of service running Orleans in the Halo system. Um, so in statistics, the, the, one of the core units of computation we had was a player grain. Um, so this is my Spartan. Um, I'm not so good at Halo, so I don't have a lot of experience. I was also on call all of launch week, so I'm gonna use that as my excuse. Um, <laughs> So um, essentially what the player grain stored was, you know, everything about my player appearance and like my unicorn decal and also all the kills and deaths and everything around that. And then so everything went through the player grain. This gave us really great data locality because all of the information about your player was in your grain and it was like on one box. And so then we essentially just used it as a write through cache. Um, so we got really low latency on our requests that were just reads because generally we had the data in memory um, based on our call pattern. 
The other thing that's interesting to note about this, right, is I said we had 11.6 unique, 11.6 million unique Halo players, right? So there's one grain for each of these guys, but they're never all in memory at the same time, and Orleans manages that lifecycle for you, so we didn't have to write any custom code to like kick people out of memory when they went offline. Um, our other core unit of computation in the statistics service was a game grain, um, and so that guy dealt with like the overall game. There were 1.5 billion games played in Halo, right? So there's 1.5 billion game grains in our system. Once again, they're only generally around for the life cycle of the game, which is about 30 minutes on average, or any time someone wanted to read information about that game from Halo Waypoint. Um, and so this is sort of the general idea of like each one of these games that you see, or each one of these like tabs on Waypoint, if you drill down into it, it would like rehydrate the game grain on our system and then serve the data from there. Um, so this is sort of like the overall architecture, right? I'm like leaving out the fact that there's no front end and I'm also leaving out our whole reliability system. So this is like very happy path. So um, just play along. I'll explain a little more later what we did. Um, so essentially, you are on your Xbox, you start playing Halo, um, you start sending data to the service about your game. We spin up a game grain and it starts aggregating all of the data um, as the game goes on. Um, eventually, you will get an end of game message and then the game grain will like go to work and it will like aggregate all the stats, store the, the, the game history in Azure blob storage, and then he sends a message to every player in the game. So there's like generally about four to 32, depending on what game type you're playing. Um, and each player will get just the data it needs to process its own statistics. Um, in practice, each player grain wrote a row that was immutable about the data that it stored for just that game, and it also updated its aggregate statistics. So, and we use this as a write-through cache, right? Because like one of the highest requests that came in, like literally, the game will then ask us, "Hey, like, what are my aggregate statistics, and like how much XP do I have to like validate that you haven't cheated or done something weird before you start playing the next game?" So having that in memory was super powerful. Um, and so it would write it to Azure Table Storage, which is a key value store, and eventually all of these guys would act and say, like, yeah, I've stored this data, and then the game grain would be like, cool, my job is done, and then he would, like, go away and kill himself, and the players would stay around, because you're probably still playing. Um, we did have a whole other path built in to deal with the fact that if one of these players couldn't persist the storage, right, because you've expanded your um, modes of where you can fail, because you're essentially doing maybe, like, 32 writes. Um, so one of them could totally fail. We had a whole uh, way to replay data through the system and deal with fault tolerance and stuff that was built on the saga pattern, but that's like a whole nother topic. Um, so this is the overall stats architecture. So let's talk a little bit about performance and scalability of Orleans. One of the coolest things that I love about Orleans is that it runs stably at 90% CPU utilization. So we saw this in practice. We were running our boxes at about 95 to 97% CPU utilization in prod. So when you pay for an extra large instance or you pay for, um, you can run this on physical machines as well. When you pay for this beefy box, like you actually get to use all of it. Um, and that's cool. Um, okay, so these graphs are from the paper. I'm gonna go through two of them. There's like a bunch in the paper if you're interested to go read more. Um, these ones are really interesting because they were ran against the Halo 4 presence system. Um, and just to give you a quick overview of that so the numbers make sense, um, Halo 4 presence, this system is basically getting the data, it's deserializing this data, and then it's doing at least two grain calls on each one of these requests. So it's not like a dumb ping test, it's actually doing real work. So uh, what they did in this test is they instantiated a million grains playing Halo, and they started varying the number of machines that they ran it on from 25 to 125, and then they just kept pushing the throughput, right? Um, and so what we saw is we saw linear, near linear scale out. Um, so we got on an average about 5,200 requests per box. Um, so that was pretty good for us, and like we didn't write any like super hard code to do this. Orleans just handled all of it for us. So that's really nice because it like sort of helped us feel a little better that if we had a lot of traffic, we could just throw more boxes at it, and it would totally solve the problem. Um, this other test is sort of doing the opposite. It basically varied the number of actors, but kept the number of machines constant. Um, so they had 25 machines running this test and they varied the number of actors from 2,000 to 2 million and then like, you know, perf tested it and you can sort of see that the throughput remains pretty constant until this high end. And essentially what's happening there is the boxes ran out of memory. Um, so you're paging data in and, out of, in and out of memory and so we were just memory constrained. So when you start seeing this, if you're profiling your service, you just kick another box at it and it'll be totally fine and scale out. Um, so that was really cool too as well. So basically we get to use all of the CPU on the box and we get to use all of the memory on the box and it runs fine. 
Okay, so let's talk a little bit about failure domains, right? Like I've painted this nice rosy picture of Orleans, and let's talk about how it solves some of the really hard distributed systems problems. Um, so you get at least once messaging guarantees in Orleans. Um, so what this means is essentially you have to be able to deal with the fact that you could see um, a message twice or more than once, right? So typical ways you solve this is you, I use idempotent operations, which are super rad. Um, we solve this also by writing a lot of immutable data. Um, so you knew if like, you, so in, for instance in statistics, I talked about we wrote two rows. We wrote an immutable row and an aggregate row. If we wrote, tried to create the immutable row because we'd already seen this message before, it would just fail, and it would fail in a predictable way. We'd get a conflict exception from the database, and then we just said, hey, we've already seen this message, and we would respond correctly. So this allowed us to do replay through the system. Um, and there's a bunch of other tricks for handling this, right, but that's just one of them. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about machine failures, right? So you're in the cloud, and we're running hundreds of cores, and they're gonna die, and I don't really wanna get woken up every time one of them dies because I would never sleep otherwise. So this is your Orleans cluster, it's running a bunch of grains, it's very happy, and then like something happens and one of the machines dies. Pick your favorite reason, like because it can't talk to anyone else because the network's unreliable or because Azure has decided to do a rolling upgrade or the hard drive died or whatever, right? So it dies, the grains on it die, they're kicked out of memory. They might have shut down gracefully, which means your deactivate async method got called, but I would not rely on that in practice because you never can guarantee that that's gonna get called. Like if a hard drive dies, you get no warning. Um, so then the next time a message is passed to one of these grains, A, B, or C, um, Orlean just spins it up on a machine that's happy and healthy and has room for it, right? And then it, everything sort of happens. And the cool thing is, is as a developer, I don't even know that this machine has gone down. I actually have no idea that the, the grain's been reactivated. Um, and then when the machine comes back up and it can rejoin the cluster, and then new grains will be added to it, right? And so this is really powerful, and this is like why virtual actors and location transparency is a big deal, right? Because if these grains were deterministically hashed to one of these machines, um, you either have to have some kind of like failover that happens that moves it to a new machine, but like you don't have to worry about that. Orleans just does it for you. Okay, let's talk about the CAP theorem for a second, um, right? This is the idea that you get consistency, availability, and part partition tolerance pick two, and you don't get to pick C and A. Um, Orleans is AP. Um, so essentially what that means is when everything is happy and the world is good and your system is fine um, and all the nodes can see each other, you're guaranteed to have one activation of a grain running at any given time. So there's one of my player grains running the system, and that's cool. If there is a partition, then Norlean sort of gives up on trying to pers uh, on grain activation, right? It might have, you might get like two activations of migraine. So you have migraine and then like my evil twin grain running in this partition and it could be totally screwing up your data store underneath. So you can handle this and we like totally did, right? Because sometimes you don't care, right? Like in the present system, I don't really care if there's two of me running because it'll eventually figure itself out when the world is happy and like I get updates every 30 seconds. So if they're getting like split, who cares, right? It'll self heal. Um, in statistics, we need to be incredibly consistent because people get really mad when you lose their stats data, it turns out. Um, it's also always the best game you've ever had when statistics vanish. Um, so, so what happens is we, um, we could detect when we had this split brain thing going on because we used the underlying consistency of our data store. Um, so we would do our writes, right? We're using it as a write through cache. So immutable data is fine because then at that point it's set union and you just, like, that's, a, that's an easy problem to solve, right? The problem was is we had this aggregate row. And so if you updated the aggregate row in your grain and there's another grain that didn't see that data, you would be missing stats. And so we just looked, we did a sort of like an optimistic locking or e-tag solution, like a conditional put on the database and said, hey, update this aggregate row, but only if it's the version that I think it is. So like I think I'm on version three, but it might be version four because there's this extra grain running um, in this partitioned mode, and if that happened, we just gave up. We just said like, hey, we're in an inconsistent state. We clearly cannot provide consistency guarantees on storage, and so just give up and we'll, pro we'll try again later, right? We had a mechanism to replay statistics and do that happen. So our statistics service was you know, consistent, um, but Orleans itself was AP. And this is, this is something that you can solve. But it, it's something you have to know and plan for, right? Okay, so um, 
You can get Orleans, it's publicly available. Uh, Microsoft released uh, a preview at Build in March this year. Um, so you can go to download the bits and play with them. Um, there are samples up on CodePlex. The source code is not actually open source, but there are papers that detail a lot of it, and the forums and stuff on there are super helpful. Um, so, and the, uh, the, the license on it has actually just been updated that you can deploy Orleans in production if you want to. Um, and that's all I got. So do you guys have questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, well, so uh, s some of it was, right? So, like, blob store, you either write or you don't. Um, and then in Azure's tables, key value, or Azure table, you had key value store, right? But they also have this cool feature of you have um, batch transactions, or you get within a partition. And so each player had their own partition that they wrote to, and so we could write multiple rows, and that's how we did a lot of the, the tricks that we did to say, like, oh, we know we already wrote this or not. Yeah. So the way that you had the uh, identifiers, like, pointing to IP addresses, I just wondered, if you ever look at using, like, that, like, with a lower than network of that, uh, does it get any kind of fires at the IP level or um, so the question was about using IPv6 to do the unique identifiers and actor references, right? So um, that would be something that the Orleans team, I know that they're looking at being able to support IP6 addresses. Um, I don't think they wanted to use that because um, essentially, like, right, then you're dependent on DNS, and so, like, that's slow to flush out of, like, that cache, right? Instead, we just, like, literally had, like, 32 bytes that floated around on each machine that told you where it was. And so we didn't, having a unique IP address wasn't important because I don't actually really care where this thing's running in memory. It's just running. Cool. Oh, come here. To get right. Okay, so we started working with the Orleans teams in July of 2011, and we shipped Halo 4 in um, November of 2012, right? So we had about 18 months to go and, and rebuild all functionality, get the stack right. So we grew from six devs to 30 at that time. Um, I think one of the, it sounds like, so when, you talk, when we talk about this, usually we talk about the fact that, you know, we did this big launch and we went from zero to like whatever, hundreds of thousands of concurrent users and it was fine, but the thing, the saving grace that we actually did is we tested this. We replaced a Halo Reach's presence system on Azure with um, Orleans and we found a lot of bugs to productionize this, right? So like, we had a memory, we found a memory leak in Orleans um, in uh, the, the holiday of uh, 2011. So I was like VIP swapping the service every eight hours through Christmas and New Year's and then we fixed it, right? And then we were able to do this. Um, and then we spent a lot of the summer, we had an internal, beta inside of Microsoft. We didn't have a public one for Halo 4. Um, and we found a really good bug there through that and perfect stress testing, um, which was like Orleans has some garbage, well, you can run into garbage collection issues with Orleans because if you think about it, you have these objects that are in memory and they're holding onto a bunch of data which gets kicked into G2, um, the G2 part of the heap, right? And so walking that becomes really expensive because that's like almost all of your data. Um, and so we had these really complex objects and we, um, we ended up figuring out, like I learned a lot about the .NET garbage collector, um, but we also ended up figuring out that we could do some tricks to optimize that we weren't copying as much data as we wanted. Um, we got the Orleans to add this immutable tag to say, I promise I will not modify this message and so therefore you don't, if they're all in the same box, you don't have nine copies of a thing, you have one. Um, and then we just did like some object pooling and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, I mean, we, we were on a very aggressive schedule, but it, it did work, and the thing that was sort of the saving grace is, you know, literally just programming features was easy. You could throw a bunch of C-sharp developers at it, and it would work, and then there was a bunch of us who went around and worked on sort of the harder, gutsy problems, and, like, we could just focus on that. Yeah? Yeah, so that was, um, like, that wasn't the problem we saw. Where we saw split brain, and we did actually find this problem during the beta, was 
uh, people's stats wouldn't be reported correctly, right? Because one grain would have one aggregate view of it and one would have a different aggregate view of it. Um, in the present system, because that system was mostly designed to just be incredibly highly available, you could get into some weird stuff where like people, like if you had split grains and, or split brain in some of the aggregate layers the, of the data that was doing some of the aggregate stuff for us, people could see different counts of people playing Halo. And, but that stuff all sort of worked itself out. Um, and it wasn't that big of a deal, so we just kind of gave up on it. We're like, yeah, like it'll figure itself out, it'll be fine. Um, so we made a lot of, lot of trade-offs because we were on such a tight schedule, but it, Orleans was flexible enough to sort of let us make those trade-offs, I guess. Yeah, it's eventually consistent, right? It's AP, right? So. Anything else? Yeah? Did you, you, you talked about data locality. Uh-huh. Uh, did you, was, was the matchmaking system for that was uh, a lot of locality geographic, or do you have, you know, do you have somebody in Taiwan playing somebody in Seattle, and then Seattle, you have to come into the, yeah, so the question was about data locality and sort of matchmaking and how that all worked. Um, so the matchmaking system is actually provided by Xbox Live. We didn't do too much to tweak with that. Um, basically, the way it works is because the box is open to persistent TCP connections, they sort of talk UDP or some like, there's a lot of bite magic happening at that level of the game, but they talk directly to each other. And so the matchmaking algorithm did try to take care of uh, matching you with someone who was close by. There was like ping tests that were involved to see like if this was a good match. The problem that we ended up running into was if you played in New Zealand, like there generally just weren't enough people online to matchmake you with because like there wasn't just enough, like on launch week it was fine, but throughout the rest of the year it like kind of sucked and we were really sorry about that, but like we had no control about that because you're essentially, we're not hosting dedicated servers, right, for Halo 4. Um, we were host, we were, you were going peer to peer at that point, so we couldn't like ensure that you had a good connection. For the data locality, what we cared about a lot was um, when I'm answering, Halo is very like, if you think about it, it's a little narcissistic in the sense that you're like, what am I doing? What am I doing? Like, what is this stat about me? Like, tell me all the awesome things about me. Tell me how to be a better Halo player. And so um, having all of your information in one place was really powerful because then we could just like, you know, do these interesting aggregations and run a bunch of data queries on it and stuff like in, in near-ish real time, right? And, and that's where the data locality from Orleans came heavily into play. We were actually only deployed, um, these services were only deployed in one data center in Virginia. We had a failover ready in Chicago, but um, in terms of like latency, we, we weren't like, we didn't have to be super, super real time, but like 100 milliseconds was okay. Yes? No. So the, so the question was, is there a master node in the Orleans cluster? And no, there is not. Um, they use a gossip-ish protocol to talk to each other to figure out who's alive and who's dead. Yes? With that gossip protocol, is there, is there an upper bound on the cluster size as a result of that? Uh, so the question was, is there an upper bound on the, the, the size of the cluster? Um, we didn't hit one. Um, there probably is, um, realistically, right? Um, it's not magic. So, but we had, I mean, we had hundreds, we had hundreds of cores deployed and we did not have a problem. Yes? I'm just processing something you said a minute ago. You said you only have one data center. Mm-hmm. And then 100 milliseconds. But you're not going to get 100 milliseconds of some guy in, not even Australia. Right. So you're not going to get 100 Right, right. So um, part of what we looked at is the bulk of those games that are sold are actually sold in the U.S. Um, so that's one way to handle it. So the question was, um, I said 100 milliseconds latency was generally okay on average. Um, we know that like, it was also probably fine to be a little higher because we weren't actually doing stuff directly with gameplay in Halo 4. Um, if you had to have something that was like, you know, I'm gonna send you a toast in game, then that would totally not be okay and we would have to co-locate the machines closer to our players, right? So there's this whole effort inside of Microsoft called um, Thunderhead, which is Azure instances spun up around the globe where you get to host dedicated servers for your game and that's provided to anyone who's developing on the Xbox One. Um, and so like there was a game called 
Titanfall that used these heavily, and they had dedicated servers that were hosted around the world by Xbox Live and Azure that ran Titanfall-specific code, and then it's co-located for you. So there's there are ways to do that. We but we were not directly impacting gameplay, so you didn't have to have like that super fast response. We were mostly doing stuff like tell me what your friends are doing, which you can have a little latency there, and the game can hide it. Um, tell me what my stats are game can hide it for us um, by like optimistically kicking off requests fast, like sooner rather than later, um, things like that. Cool. Thanks, you guys.